So here we are again. Uh, it's Christmas time. We're having a lot of fun coding and doing some recreational code, but also doing a little bit of work code. And one of the requirements I have at, at work, generally speaking, is to make a remote connection between one server to another. And in this case, the server is a pod inside running inside a Kubernetes cluster. And it needs to be able to make an outbound connection, remote connection, to a, a you know an, a, another computer that's actually running batch processing and stuff, running machine learning jobs and things. And it needs to be able to go out to that system and talk to it and and do something on it to run, you know, call a command or run a command. And the tool, if you don't know, the tool for doing this since the dawn of time has, has been pretty much the dawn of secure time and before it was Telnet, right? But but for now, it's Secure Shell. So what is Secure Shell? Secure Shell is what allows you to do remote connections. You know, you can, you, most of you are probably familiar with it. So, you know, like SSH into, um, let me just, let me do that over again. SSH into uh as blah, I set up an account called blah over here at localhost. So this is a remote connection. We'll pretend like my localhost is, is a thing. Now I didn't, I didn't tell it what uh, secure key to use here, and I'm, I'm actually going to cheat and I'm going to try something. I, I, this is kind of a fun little thing. I think you can actually set the identity, and I put a, I, I put a, a fake identity in my, in my test directory temporarily. So. Yeah, my, my previous yeah, yes, and I committed it to GitHub. It doesn't matter because it's just local. This account will be dead after this. Uh, oh no, it's a private key file. Uh, it has bad permissions, so I didn't like that. All right, well let me try that. I don't do this at home. <laughs> don't put private keys in your GitHub unless you absolutely know what you're doing. You'll get flagged and stuff. The reason I did this is because I was testing the use of a private key. And I wanted people to see what a PEM file looks like as a private key. So it's very deliberate i don't want anybody to get the wrong idea but just for the sake of this test i wasn't planning this i'm going to go ahead and shut the permissions down on this temporarily to see if i can demonstrate what it means to use a a key file to make a connection um and as you can see i am now connected i mean you can you can imagine that locals in that case was another machine so what i did is i made a, a remote connection to the same machine and and I told that I wanted to use that identity file, that specific identity file. Now, the identity file, I'm going to show you the identity file. Let me say this again. Do not show people your private key files, right? I'm doing this for the sake of demonstration with an account that's been locked down and you're fine. So, so this is what these files look like, right? So you have this private key. Oh, no, you know, rewrite that down, right? So this is my private key. This is, this is in a format called PEM, P-E-M. I don't even know what PEM stands for. What does PEM stand for? I don't know. PEM stands for... That's not it. Let's see. PEM stands for crypto. And we're not talking, we're not talking Bitcoin. We're talking like actual crypto. Uh, PEM file. What does it stand for? Someone, someone fill me in. I cannot remember. Pack is partial invitation message. Blah, blah, blah. All I've ever heard him call this pen files. Uh, the pen file standard, by the way, came. From, you know what? I know what we can do. Mgo doc encoding slash pem. Yeah, there is like an entire library just for pem. Package pem implements the pem data encoding, which originally which originated in the privacy enhanced email. Really? Pem stands for privacy enhanced mail. I did not know that. I learned something today. So pem stands for privacy enhanced mail, which is you know open PGP and and GPG and all of that stuff. So, so that's where PEM came from. That's kind of cool. I did not know that. Anyway, so, 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 so that's going to become an, a, become a, an important thing later. Um, oh no, there's my private key again. So, as I said, so this is a traditional way of connecting. So you can normally it will try to find your default identity uh, when you're using SSH. When you said SSH, I assume you know a little bit about SSH, but this is what we're doing. And so then you connect as that user at this target host, right? And and if I want to, oh, that was nice. And and so if I, oh look, old sad man gave me five dollars. Isn't that awesome? So then we could go here. We could do. We could schmod this. Uh, well, we already modded the file. So if we did an SSH into here and we did colon 22, that's the default port, right? But normally you would ha you don't, wouldn't have to say the port. So like if I try to do port 23 or something, it won't do it. If I do port 22, it'll get there and it'll get in just fine. Uh, that's interesting. It doesn't have a port. Oh, no, it's not 20. Is it 22? It is 22. Why does it not like 22? It should like it. 
Oh, it's that. Is it SP twenty two? I don't remember. Let's try. It is okay. So, I, I always forget. It's not a it, okay. That's that's important. So, if you're using the command, you have to do dash p. You can't specify the port and the target. Apparently, I mean, I thought you could. I guess not. So, SSH username at port. Or UII. Oh, yeah. do you have to put SSH in the front? Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, learning a lot of things here. So let's do that. Let's put SSH in the front. We'll put SSH uh, in the front of here. Yeah, I, I, this is mostly for my own interests. Uh, I have never done it this way, so I want to do it this way. So we'll say user at localhost colon 22. How's that? Is that going to work? What? All right, well, I don't ever do that, but now you know. So so you can actually do that. You can actually go connect to it using the SSH URL, uh, or you can write it all out. You actually can do it this way, too. You can do dash U, blah, that, this I know, and then dash P. They do that on Mr. Robot, actually. And uh, I don't know why that's not working. That should work. They, they have to be in the right order. This is why I don't like get up, by the way. I do not, do not like get up. I don't know. We're just having fun here. What, what is the U? I mean, the, I, I don't do any of these things usually, so this is why I'm doing it this way. Host, we're not doing the tunnel, the login name. Oh, L, 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 L. It's L. It's L. Okay, there we go. So that should work. All right, so those are all the different ways to use SSH as a client, you know, client server kind of thing. Server, you know, the client is the thing that connects into something. And so so that's that's what we're doing. Um, that's really good. We're going to go ahead and, we'll go ahead and do that. Uh, but, okay, so how do I translate uh, this kind of thing into um, uh, Ben? Um, so how do I translate this sort of thing into Go? So I don't have to install SSH. I can just use it from a container and do all of that stuff, right? How do you do that? How do you do that? Well, this is going to be how I'm going to show you. Now, there's one other thing that we're missing uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to simulate it actually. So give me a second to simulate this. I want you to see, oh, we're doing all the things you would normally do from the command line. And then we're going to, I'm going to show you how to do it from go code without the command line. Okay. And what we need to do is get rid of, uh, a known, the known host entry for blah, uh, for local host that so we have a local host entry in here. This is, this is where all of this stuff gets added. And I'm trying to see, I, th I think we already have a local host entry in there. I don't know. I'm trying to trying to figure out where that one is. And I don't know the XSH command for this. But if we were to go in here, one of these things has our host ID in here. You know what let's do? Let's just temporarily move it. So if we move .ssh known host, I mean, this isn't going to hurt anything. Let's just move it in to temp, get it out of the way. Now, if I try to make that connection again, this should bark at me and say, I don't know who that host is. I've never connected. And the way, what happens when you do this is it adds a fingerprint, which is really not very secure, but it's usually everybody always says just yes. It's supposed to protect you against man in the middle attacks. It means that you've gone in and you've said, okay, I trust that this connection to this, you know, our IP address, our IP address over here is the right thing. And therefore I'm going to add it into my, my known host. And then, uh, yes, um, it's not my name. So we go ahead, we go ahead and add it and then it makes a connection, right? And then we go over here and if we go look at this known host file, you'll see it's got, uh, oh, look at that. It added an entry for every one of the keys that I have. That's interesting. I didn't realize it was going to, and I, I believe the way to look at that is SSH, uh, which one is it? Key scan. Key scan. And don't worry, this isn't private. This is key scan will show you all the all the IDs by which this computer is known. Right? And I mean localhost is known. So if we put localhost in here, those are all of them, right? So these are all the localhost entries. This is very important. So these are public keys. Therefore, I want to say it again. This is not violating my security in any way. This is these are these are public keys that are listed in this way using a specific format. And you can put these these lines in your authorized underscore uh, keys file, or you can put them into your known host file, uh, which I learned the other day that is actually the same. Uh, and so so now you've got 
all this stuff in here, right, that, that you can use to connect. And, 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 and that way, when you make a connection, and this has happened to me before, I've changed the IP address of, of a machine that I, without changing its, its known host entry, and SSH does not let you connect to it. It's like, oh, I'm sorry, you can't do that. That's, uh, you know, it's, in, it's invalid because, you know, it's been changed. Somebody's messing with you with the IP. And you have to go in and explicitly take, uh, you know, those known host lines. It'll tell you the line you have to remove, and you have to, you can do it through a command as well, and you, you have to remove those, those lines, right? So that is, that is kind of like a super crash course in SSH. Now, this, this video wasn't intended to be about SSH, but it's really important that you understand that what SSH is before we get into it, so you have some sense of it. And so when we make a when we make it, the code that we're going to write is exactly the same as this. The only thing different now. So in addition to make, if I do it by default, it will it will dump me into a shell, right? And that's fine. And we're not going to do that today. Well, what we usually want to do when we're writing middleware or something is we want to actually run a command over there, and we want to capture the output of the command. And SSH the command actually allows you to put the command on the command line over here, and it will just take whatever the remaining arguments are. But in this case, let's put them all in a thing. So we could do ls-l tilde, right? Now, this is something I found is interesting, is that, uh, thank you. So, oh, there's nothing there, right? So let's do ls-l, but I want you to see that it actually resolved, uh, it actually resolved the tilde. Okay, and so this is this is going to be important when we come when we write our Go code. So what it does is it takes this argument, and if you if you put a bunch of arguments independently, I think it also does the same thing. But mostly though, it's probably better to, for you to combine them because otherwise you're going to like run into these arguments, right? They're going to conflict. So this last argument here is the command to run on the server, the, the target server. So it ran that command, it made a connection as blot, ran the command as blot. In fact, you can do anything here. You could do, um, you could say like, like I don't know, echo dollar user. And you see how it's it's quoted, so it'll actually resolve user on the target system. And uh, you know, so this shows, this proves that, that it's running it as as user blah on after it's made a remote connection, and it's dumping the standard error, error, error and standard output to my terminal, having done all the work remotely, and then come back. And you can actually check uh, the return codes. Uh, you see it's a return code of zero because it was true. Uh, if we do stuff like this, let's just try to do something we can't do. So let's, let's cat Etsy, uh, Etsy secret, which it does not have permissions to do. So this will not let it happen. And you see that we get, we get a one return code because what this is right. We get a cat. Now this, this looks like it ran on the same on the local machine, but it did it. It ran on a remote machine. It just, we just happen to be emulating a remote machine by connecting localhost. So, so it's making the connection, right? And it's dumping this. This is not going to standard error though. I'm going to prove it. So if I if I redirect uh, the standard error, which is to uh, to uh, dev null, that should get us. Um, oops, let me try this. I don't know if I have to. Oh wait 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 wait. I have to do it right here. Yeah, to redirect to dev null. Remember to the to uh, file uh, um, descriptor is have uh, is a uh, standard error and so that as you can see goes away right now if i do something successful it will it'll print it to standard uh, standard output instead of standard error so there's two output streams and they mix to get mixed or hard to try to tell apart but those are the two things that go together and so then we're going to have ls-l on this and we see that oh hey you know it it didn't do actually that sent everything to that's interesting huh why didn't it, what did it set to, it should, it should be, oh, no, there's no Etsy secret, no such file directory, it's secrets, yeah, of course, all right, so, all right, now let's, let's, what, no, it says a secret, <laughs> why does it say it doesn't exist? That is weird. It's it definitely exists. Wait, did they move it? You guys know that Etsy password, Etsy secret, right? That's weird. Did I kill it? I didn't do anything as root yet. But 
that's very weird to me. Yeah, I, I'm doing. I'm having a brain fart or something. This is secrets where the actual passwords get stored and stuff. I wonder. It sounds like they might have got rid of it. Yeah, that's very fascinating. Uh, that's due to me. Anyway, um, did, I, did they change it on a budget server? When did they get rid of it? I mean, that's a, that's been a standard thing forever. Uh, either that or I delete it on accident, which is also possible. Uh, and I just snap back my. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't think that's the reason. I, I think it might be something related to Pam, actually. Yeah, that that's that's got me a little confused. Yeah, I'll have to go back and look at that. But I mean, now you know. So Etsy password is just you know. I mean, there's nothing wrong with me showing you what's an Etsy password, right? So Etsy password is where all of your accounts are, and it used to have it used to have this the secrets in there, uh, where the X is, right? Um, and then they stopped doing that, and then they put that all into it's, oh shadow. Did I put that? You know what it is? You know what? Thank you so much. I feel like it's being stupid. It's Etsy shadow, of course. <laughs> It's I. It's the Kubernetes has ruined me because everything in Kubernetes is secret, 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 right? And it's of course it's an Etsy shadow the whole entire time. Oh my god, I, my I am so lame. I'm lame. I'm a lame old dude, just like that troll said. So it is because of Kubernetes. <laughs> uh, it's actually shadow. Okay, so there we go. So it it shows that it's there and everything. But what I was trying to show you is that that output is not standard error. Right, because if I redirect uh, to dev null, you'll still see it because it's standard output and not standard error. So if you don't know the difference, you know, look into it. But that's going to become important because we're going to write our code. It needs to capture. So, so here's the requirements for the code we're going to write. Right, we need to create a function that basically does this. It does that, but without installing secure shell. That is the goal. We want to be able to tell it where the identity file is, which is just a PEM file that's got a secret in it because the pub key can be implied from the secret. The reason we have to have the, se the secret in there, the private one, is because it has to be a signer and it has to be able to sign uh, the content and the, and the connections and everything. And so if you have it, you can't sign anything without a private key. I mean, you, you can sign it with a public key, but then only the person with the private key can read it. It's a different thing. But in this case, we need the private key. So we have to tell it what identity file. So that's the first requirement. We need to tell it what we want to connect to like this. Now, we, we, we are actually going to end up uh, creating something. I mean, this is kind of, kind of convoluted, weird way to write it, right? Why don't we write it in the nice, happy ways? You know, using the URL, and we just write blah, and you can actually put a password if you're doing password login. Okay, that's important. I say that too. So SSH does allow you to do password logins, but if you do it, you're an idiot. Nobody should ever allow password logins for SSH ever. There's never an excuse to do it ever. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. There's no excuse. Uh, so don't do it. So localhost 22. So this that this is what we're connecting to, right? And this is what we need to recreate. And we want to we want to take the standard output and the standard error and the return code, and we want to have all of that stuff available to our Go code directly without without subshelling out to call SSH or anything like that. So that that's the requirement here, right? Very 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 common use case. Uh, and I mean you know and it, so 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 if you want you know the first thing you might do is you're like trying to do this with Go is you might wander in you might wander into the Go uh, crypto uh, package, right? crypto SSH and you'd be like, okay, let's read this. And this can be overwhelming. First of all, a lot of people don't understand how SSH works in the first place and setting it up just with SSH clients, but let alone them. Uh, but you know, then they throw you all this stuff because SSH is much, much, much more than just a, a way to run a remote command. It's, you can do tunneling, it can do interactive sessions. It can, it's just really amazing. And, and it's the, it's pretty much the basis of of, of all operations communications these days, uh, that and TLS, which is the HTTPS stuff. So, so then, um, I mean, if it's if if you're remotely connecting to a computer these days, you're using you're either using one of three things. You're using HTTP, TLS, which is HTTPS. You're using which is socketing based encryption. You're using SSH, which is interactive socket based encryption, like we're going to do today. Or you're using content encryption, which is Open PGP or GPG, and then you're encrypting the content, and you don't care how it gets sent around. And that's how I do for Keg because I don't necessarily want to depend on you know secure protocol tunneling. But so those are the three ways to to communicate securely uh, in you know 2022, 20, 23. So 
But if you look at this package, you might be overwhelmed because you're like, my God, look at all this stuff here. We got user sir, key sir algorithms. What's the RSA? Should I use RSA? Should I use ED2, D509? What should I do? Oh, I'm marshaling and unmarshaling public keys. Uh, you know, there's just so many things. It can be really overwhelming. So today, the goal of today's video is to is to take away uh, the complexity of this and to create some sensible default assumptions and do you know, essentially what we just did with our use case. And we're going to be making some, some, so we're not going to be using password callbacks. We're going to be using public keys. We're going to make a signer uh, and we're going to create a client and then we're going to make our connection. So before we get into the code, uh, uh, I, I want to write about this a little bit. So I think I actually have this in, in here. Um, so, so, so the first thing, let's write down the algorithm here, okay? So the first thing we're going to have to do is we need to get the credentials and stuff, right? So the first step we need to do is uh, get get the user and target a host uh, IP and port, okay? So that's the first thing. And then, I mean, I could do this with, I can do this with just one and then a markdown will fix it for me. Uh, so then what? After we get that, then we need to make, we need to dial a connection. So uh, dial a connection. So we actually wait. So we need to dial, let's see, create a client, create an SSH client and dial, dial a connection. So the word dial is common in the TCP world. Still, it just means that you've made a TCP IP connection to a thing or UDP or whatever, right? So we're going to create an SSH client dial to dial A. We're going to use TCP for this. You can actually say whether you want TCP or, or UDP, but we're going to use TCP. Uh, how's it going? And then, so we create an SSH connection. We dial in that. And now we have a connection. Now, this, this is something that, as I was doing the research, I was really pleased to discover. So the SSH library, the SSH client library, once it gets a connection to the target host, it keeps the connection open until you close it, which is kind of cool. So if you wanted to send multiple commands subsequently, you can do that. And it's, it, you're not going to have the overhead of dialing up a new connection. They even have a way to redirect channels and stuff. All of that stuff is really cool, but overly complex and confusing to somebody who just wants to run a command on a remote host. And so we're going to bypass a lot of that and, by using uh, something. So once you get a connection, in order to run a command uh, they have a thing called a session, say, create a session. So a session is not like an HTTP session. A session is one execution of a command. That's what it is. And so you create a session uh, and set uh, parameters on it. So there are some things we're going to have to tell it about. We're going to have to tell it about, you know, what, um, you know, what, what kind of authentication we want? What do we want to do with standard input and output? Does it have any standard input? That's right. You can actually pipe standard input to an SSH command. And in fact, let me prove that to you really quick. So if I, uh, let me see if I can find it. Where was I? Where's our thing? Okay. So, so here we have, here, here our command is this. Let's, 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 let's change our command. Let's change our command to be cat. All right. So you know cat, the cat command doesn't do anything unless it has standard input, right? So if I just run cat, it will actually hang because it won't have anything to run, right? Unless I give it standard input. So let's just, I actually want to see it hang. Let's run it without giving it anything to cat. So we're going to run it like that. It's like hanging around. It's like, I don't know what to do. We say, hello, enter. And it echoes it back. So, so the SSH command does some cool things. It actually maintains an open connection to the remote server. So that's cool and all, but in, for our case of our command, we just want to capture the output, right? And and it does do some things to save you from blocking like that. But if you wanted to to do this, I could just pass it in a variable um, with, yeah, I mean, any number of ways. Let's do this. So let's say hello there. So this will pass in the hello there line, and that will run. And it it'll go into the standard input of cat, and cat will cat it, and then we'll see it on our on our output. So it's as if we just ran a thing locally, right? So that is to show you that there are standard input, standard error, standard out. All three streams are involved, uh, and can be can be managed and handled. Okay. So create a session and set parameters, and stud in if we have it. Uh, we might not have stud in, but if we don't, that's fine. And then what? And then we need to uh, run. We need to run, run the session. 
Okay, we're gonna run. We're gonna after we get the session all set up, then we run it. We get it to execute, and there's four different ways to run a session, and we're gonna use the the one of the simpler ways. So we're gonna run this session or uh, to execute uh, the command remotely, and cap. Okay, and then we're gonna um, and then we're gonna uh, capture buffer buffer. Uh, buffer the stud out stud error uh, into strings, uh, and then we're going to return uh, return the uh, stud out stud error and exit uh, and error if and and errors if any. Okay, so this. I mean, it, it seems pretty basic, right? But when I show you the code, even though it's only 80 lines, it's not, there's a couple of gotchas in there that I had to Google and search for or whatever. I duck, duck, I don't Google it. Um, and so we'll, we'll go ahead and, and look for those. Why isn't that my dictionary? That should be in my dictionary for sure. So so we're going to add that. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to get the user target host and IP import. So we have something to connect to. We're going we're gonna to create an SSH client and we're going to dial up a TCP IP connection to a remote host. In this case, we'll simulate the remote host as being local host running a server as a different user, blah, like we were doing. And then we're going to create a session that's going to represent, um, uh, you know, what it is that we're going to run. And that includes the command, by the way. Um, and we're going to, like, set up all the buffering and everything. And then we're going to execute the session. We're going to capture the standard output and error. We're going to load that lot up into memory. And there'll be at least one person out there that's going to be like, that's a bad idea because you're not limiting the amount of memory you're going to be loading up. And and I did put a warning on this because this is designed to be the kind of thing you would do from a shell script. No one's going to worry about how much, how much you know, variable space you're capturing when you load it into a variable and you're writing a bash code, right? But but when they see Go code or something like that, they're like, oh my God, you got to be really careful. So we are assuming a trusted source for this. So if we run a command, we're assuming that the amount of output from that command is is a reasonable, a reasonable size that will fit within the memory constraints of the, you know, local machine that's calling the you know the remote command so because it's going to transfer all that data and it's going to it's going to buffer it up before it returns it back as a variable and there are lots of ways to get around that if we were dealing with like high-end uh you know data and we had a lot of data to deal with and we wanted to open up a concurrent pipe and and and, and act on it as each line comes in there's a, tons of ways to deal with that ssh deals with that wonderfully but we don't care about that because as i said the sensible default here is i just want to run the command and get the output and that's like 99 percent of the people out there they just want to run this ssh command and get whatever its output is and time out within a reasonable amount of time which is kind of a bonus i didn't add that but that might be a bonus that we had uh, timeout after a reasonable amount of time. And for that, we should probably will add um, a context context um, at some point. I don't have that in my code at all yet, but it, that's I don't know if that necessarily should be a part of the SSH run command. It should probably be outside of the function that we're doing uh, if you want to set up your own timeouts and things like that. And so, you know, I'll, I'll put it there just for reference in case somebody wants to try that. All right, so let's let's jump into the code and and start to look at what's required to make this happen. Uh, and directory with fifty thousand lines. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Mm. I mean, and there's definitely ways you could put stuff in there if you wanted to limit the amount of input. You could definitely do that, and and maybe I need to do that. Let's actually add an issue. Um, uh, let's see, add package global for maximum uh, size of stud out and stud error uh, buffering. Uh, is it, we're not, because, because this is, we're, again, this is one step above shell scripting. So, yeah. Yes, we are, <laughs> we want performance above, above a lot of that other stuff. But, but, these are all things that are like the next level. You know, we don't want to do the whole premature optimization thing. So we're just going to write the minimum stuff necessary. Uh, well, it, it, okay. So the I don't want anybody to worry. So Ryan's concerned here. I don't want anybody to worry because in this situation, we have exact control over what is being called. I know exactly what's being called. So for me, this level of security that that y'all are talking about with the buffering and everything is is accomplished by the simply saying, if you don't trust the thing you're running, then don't use this. 
And that's a perfectly acceptable way to proceed with security. It's like, it's like the balance between checking for nil values on every single input variable for every call to the command. You know, you kind of have to have, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, Ray, we don't want to get into that whole uh, stuff. Um, I mean, there's people that would be so paranoid about stuff like that, that they would check every one of these input variables to see if they were nil before they did anything, right? Uh, this That's not a use case, though. In this case, this is the way it's not a use case is we eliminate it as a use case. Note that there are no limitations on the size of input and output, meaning run should only be used when calling remote commands that can be trusted not to produce too much output. That That is my optimization. By saying, if you are doing that, you're doing it wrong. And rather than do all of the counting and manipulation to try to check the buffer length as we go, because I would be putting overhead on it. I mean, there's other things it's like people, people will put locks on maps that don't need it and go and that kind of thing. So I'm not attacking anybody. I just, if you want that, you can come back and add it, but we need to know what the basic thing is. What is the equivalent to writing a shell script SSH remote command and buffering the variables? That's what we're doing here. We're not writing anything beyond that. Right. Uh, so this and in fact, this there was some discussion about whether to implement what I've done and go just as a shell script, because you can do all of this with a shell script and just redirect it to a file and and call it a day and then go open up those files and deal with them and delete the files and everything, uh, which I mean, you still have the same consideration because you can fill file system really easily, especially if depending on the container and everything. So, I mean, this is just the beginning. But if you but this is enough to get you the concepts okay so we have a we have a, a document here that kind of describes the discovery of all of this stuff we take a target um so the target line here is is this right it's just like ssh line and i thought i thought about maybe forcing the ssh in front of it but i thought what the hell let's just do this and so we have the target which is going to get split up here and it's going to become the user and the address down here and then we have, um, then we have, we have a user key, the the private key, and then we have the host public key. And strangely, these things are in a different format. Because I, that's the reason I wanted to show you that private that private key was that U key is uh, in PEM format. And H key is in authorized keys format. So that means it has the local, I mean, you cut and paste it out of your, like when I did the SSH dash um, key scan, that that's the kind of line that we're looking for here, right? So that's what this is going to be. And this is going to be the PEM file that has a private key in it. And these can come from anywhere, right? They can come from a file. They can come from an environment variable. If that's your thing, I don't like doing that, but, but container people love that. Um, and, you know, secrets and pods, whatever. Um, and then we have the actual command, uh, which is one string, not, you know, args all broken down. This is actually a command line that gets passed to the shell of the user, which I found very interesting when I was playing with that. Uh, it does resolve glob, globs and all kinds of stuff, which uh, yeah, I don't know how I feel about that, um, but it does. It does do that. And then we have uh, the optional input string. Uh, which, as standard input. Now, you would see this in, in Go. A lot of times you see this as a byte buffer. Uh, again, as I'm making an assumption here. So we are making a bunch of, of, I think, reasonable assumptions, sensible assumptions here to speed things along. Uh, for example, um, these are almost always going to be loaded from a file. So they're already going to be byte slices, right? Uh, this kind of stuff, if we made it into a byte slice, we'd be casting it as a string and all kinds of thing. And we're like, well, what if you want to pass standard input that's not a string? And I say, well, then use a different function. This is not, this is a function that's designed for the most common use cases. Like I wanted to type some things into the command line and have them run. And I wanted to send it a text file or something like that. Right. But I couldn't pass in, uh, like an image of standard input on if I wanted to here, because it's a string instead of a byte slice. I could cast it and everything. Some people, you can make the argument that this should have been a byte slice, but same with here. So the standard out and the standard error, there's no, there's nothing that says that it has to be a string, right? But except for the fact that this particular function is making a sensible assumption that this is the equivalent of running SSH from the command line, which means I'm going to be getting a string of stud out and a string of stud error. Could be YAML, could be text, could be HTML, whatever. And then I'm just going to parse the thing. And, and then we have the error, which is you'll see later. This is this is how 
uh, the underlying uh, SSH client uh, behaves to return exit codes other than zero. So any exit code other than zero is returned here. Unfortunately, and this is this is the only huge flaw I found with this whole approach, is that you cannot get the exit value without parsing the error string. And if somebody knows how to do that and I haven't found it yet, let me know. But the exit error type, SSH.exit error type, does not embed an integer exit value, which I found extremely weird. Uh, it prints it out. It prints it out and you can go parse it other. But most of the time we really don't care about the exit value. We just want to know that something went wrong and it wasn't zero. So I'm okay with that. Again, another sensible assumption. So here we go, we're, we're like parsing, we do strings split the target, this splits it on the at sign, and then t becomes a, a, a length of two. We check the length is exactly two and not more, and that is, um, uh, that's gonna keep us from crashing or getting null pointer errors if, there's not, if they've done the, this part wrong. And, um, and then we, uh, you know there's something new, I don't do this normally, but when you're returning a bunch of stuff, uh, like if I were returning two strings and I need to disambiguate on the command line here, otherwise I don't want to have like string comma string comma string, right? So this is a this is a, a convention that's popular in Go, uh, and when you do this though, every single return value has to have an identifier, right? And I've combined these two because they're both string types. Same over here with byte slices. Some people don't like to do that. I love doing that, um, and. By doing that, when I return here, you'll see here that this is normally a return error, right? But in this case, I just return. I set the error without a walrus operator. I set the error and I set and I got a return value, and that that means that whatever the present value of these, which is these are all you know zero value at that point, which is empty string, then and then error will be returned. So error gets set and that gets returned. So it does make you know when, when you have when you have a reasonably large number of return values. And there's, you know, there are a lot of them out there. There are a lot of functions that have more than three return values. Uh, this does make your code a little more sensible um, when you're when you're handling returns, um, and, and you have to have it in return no matter what, even if it's at the very end. Okay, so so then we we've got our user and our address, and then w this is the interesting thing. So we need to create a signer. As I said, a signer is. Um, let me show you. So a signer is is so, a basically a private key that has the ability to sign you know content in some cases and you can go look at it here here it says so this says a parse private key it wants pen bytes as we said it, gi it gives you a signer and an error returns a single from the pm encoded private key it supports the same keys as parse raw private key uh, if the private key is encrypted, it will return a passphrase missing error. So you can you can actually I don't know why you would, but you can actually use uh, keys with passphrases. Uh, if you did that though, you'd have to hard code your passphrase or load your passphrase from some other place. And I uh, I guess there's some cases where you might need that, but in this case, you're generally going to be creating a passphrase less key uh, to to do the connection, and then you're going to be protecting. Uh, that key itself uh, pretty strongly, like as a as a pod, you know, as a, as a Kubernetes secret or something. And so you've taken, you know, if you, to, to add a passphrase would be, you know, in that case, in that case, an unnecessary addition for that. Now I use passphrases for my own private keys and SSH and stuff because if somebody gets a hold of your private key, it's your only, it's your last defense uh, against them being able to use it for anything. But but for this kind of thing where we're just establishing a connection, we don't we don't really need one. So we're just going to do parse private key. There is a uh, another option for this um, that is uh, I think it's parse private passphrase key. Uh, I'm trying to find it here. Let me see. Uh, M doc s m go doc ssh. So uh, where is it? Parse. Parse raw, parse raw, parse raw. Let me see if I can find it. Parse. Oh, there's parse. Parse north art node keys, parse authorized key. There it is. There it is. God, look at that being a long C like name. Parse private key with passphrase. So you can do that if you want, but I would suggest that's more for like creating interactive tools and such. Which you can do. I've thought about making my own lightweight SSH bonsai branch just to do connections that comes with me in my monolith so I don't have to install SSH on anything. That would be kind of nice, huh? Whether it's a backdoor that I've established or it's, you know, it's an operation system that I don't want to install SSH on. 
Mm. Okay, so so here we have we we have the we parse the signer out now. The uh, we're going to use the signer later. The the signer gets used down here in our authentication method. So this I'm kind of jumping ahead to the dial thing, but we're doing two things at once. We're 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 instantiating a client configuration, and we're passing the client configuration, the SSH client configuration, to uh, our dial up connection, which is going to return a connection. So we're kind of skipping the step of creating the client explicitly. Uh, dial does that. It creates a client for us and hands us off a client connection uh, if we pass in this stuff over here. But the reason we have a signer is because one of the authentication methods, you can authenticate with no passphrase, you can pay interactively, you can you can do host-based authentication. There's lots of ways to do SSH authentication, but the overwhelming industry standard for authentication is to use pu you know public key. And if you're using you know, an interactive user system, a public key with, um, uh, you know, passphrases on the key. So that means if I were to SSH into something, uh, it would actually ask me for my passphrase. This is how GitHub identifies itself. It's how, you know, everything everything works to, to do its identification. So I, even though this is a slice and I can put a whole bunch of other authentication methods here, I really don't need them, right? I just want the public keys one and I have to give it a signer. Now I could do um, comma SSH public keys comma and I can have multiple public keys listed here if I wanted to. So if I wanted to have that, I could. But again, this signer came from the argument. So the goal is to have a single command, right? So we're passing in the U key and and that gets that's just a pen private key, right? File. And that gets converted into a signer, which we're going to use to do our thing. So we didn't have to put it anywhere. We didn't have to SSH key gen or any of that. I mean, we did at some point much earlier in order to get the PEM file before it got passed to the run thing, but but not there. All right. So then then we have this guy and I got to tell you this this one fried my brain. I I was like looking at this and I could I could not get my head around it. Not to mention the fact that both parth authorized keys and parse uh known hosts, both of them work. Uh I went with parse authorized keys because when you the output of SSH key gen, I mean SSH uh, scan keys, was it key scan? The S the output of SSH key scan for a given target is in authorized host format by default. It's not in known host format. And I did some research, some preliminary research, and it seems like both of them are compatible, even though they're different fields and stuff. If you've ever looked at known hosts, we were looking at it, it's, it's not nearly as 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 informational which is another reason that i like um this way but the the the, auth the authorized host format for these things for these public keys uh includes the ability to write a comment it includes uh an optional an optional host up front so so you know when at rest as as text it's it's, it's it tells you what the algorithm is um it, it's just easier to digest um and manage uh, than the than the no host format so I went with that. Now, how did I get the key for my target host? Well, I did what I just did. I ran SSH scan keys, got the key for the one, and it took me some time to figure out that the ED the the ECDC DSA SHA two NISP P two fifty six was the uh, primary key the, the the that my SSH server is using to identify itself to the client coming in. So when the client comes in and says, hey, I don't know you. And he's like, oh, here I am. Do you trust me? Yeah. And it's like, fine. Okay, here's my key. And the key, and I, I, I might need to look into this a little bit more. If you, if you know, please put it in the comments. But the key that it, that it said it was okay with, it turned out it was this one. And so I tried all of the keys that are listed in scan keys. And it was this one that was the money one. And I had to actually try them all to see which ones would work. Um, so... I, I have a feeling this has to do with how your SSH server is configured and, and right. I mean, I could have gone through and got the proper command, you know, the proper line in my configuration to figure out which key was identifying the host uh, from the list. And it's in your SSHD. It's the SSHD. If you want to go find them in there, uh, I like the scan keys command much better. It's much easier to do it that way. And then I kind of went through during testing and I tried each one until I got a successful connection. And this is the one that worked. Um, kind of a hacker approach to figuring it out but um so 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 that's what that is that's that's what that's what goes in hq um 
what I wasn't expecting, and, and I'm going to put this in there, what I, what I was not expecting. So if you look at parse authorized keys, all those fields I told you, all those wonderful fields, right? Well, they get returned. So you get the comments, you get any of the potential options, uh, you get the rest. And when I first saw this, I was like, what the hell? And then the error. So the, the, one of the things that bit me when I first did this is I, I just copied all of the, I, I, I wrote everything from the scan keys out into a file, right? I wrote everything out into a file and then I pointed, I pointed my test case at the file. Well, and I'll, and I'll show you that test right now. Uh, in fact, I'll, I'll turn it back on right now. It's off, but I'll turn it on. It's a, one of these ignored example tests. So I, I pointed, I pointed my, um, I pointed my file at the host pub key and I had all of them in there, right? I had all the scan key stuff out there and it didn't work. And then I found out it was like only grabbing the first one. And it, it took me a while to figure out that the command itself, you have to read about it closely, but the, but the parse authorized keys file, uh, only grabs the first one. It grabs the first one out of the file. It'll continue to read through the different lines of the file. And then it, what it returns is it returns the rest variable. So the rest variable is all of the bytes that come after that. So like you'd have to recursively call this in a loop or something if you wanted to parse every authorized key uh, from the file. You'd have to run it through a loop and, and get every one. But in this case, again, sensible defaults, we only have the one, which means that file, that, that string that gets passed in is is always only going to have the one file in it. And and the reason that it's only going to have the one file in it is because we want to use uh, the explicit host key callback. Uh, the, the host key callback is the thing that does the validation of the host, right? And there's two of them that they recommend. You can make your own. You can write your own extremely elaborate function if you wanted to go out and call out to a service or anything i mean you could you could dynamically maintain all of your authorized you know hosts in some remote service and call into that through security secure methods somehow i mean there's so many amazing things to do here uh, or, or you could just completely ignore it in fact um if you look at this let me show you if you look at um let me see if i can find it so the m doc go doc ssh uh, I'm trying to find it. So uh, there's, um, okay, so here's the other one, right? So, <laughs> you know, most people just say, okay, I trust you as a host. Well, the equivalent of doing that is setting your host key callback to a callback, by the way, is a function that's called in order to get the value at the time at runtime. That's why it's called a callback because it, 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 it takes what would otherwise be set as a, as a variable and turns it into something that's evaluated dynamically at runtime. That's what a callback is. Uh, people use that for events, event callbacks that are, you know, handlers that are associated with certain things that happen. Um, and so, so here we have insecure host key callback. So, if you set it to this, it won't do any host key checking at all. So if you are like, say you're in internally inside of a Kubernetes cluster and you're in an absolutely now there's going to be, you know, zero trust people that are going to tell me don't do that. But if you are in an environment where you are guaranteed to trust every host in the entire system and have no man in the middle attacks, you could set this and by and delete uh, that variable. So the H key that I pass in, wouldn't even need it at all, right? Uh, the next best step up from that, I think, is fixed host key, which says this specific connection is only to this host. That means if you do not know the, if you don't have a copy of the public key for that, the target host that you're attacking, that you're trying to connect to, it won't work. It just won't work. It will It will say, I'm sorry, you've got to provide what host it is that you're trying to connect to. And you need to provide proof that, that I can run uh, that this is actually the host. If you want to get rid of the proof, though, you can do the ignore thing and, and get rid of that. OK, but the thing that tripped me up the most when I was writing this and, and, and this was this 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 it took a search or two for this was um, uh, th this. OK, so parse authorized keys. This parses the authorized keys file. That's where we get that format. Right. And you saw what the file looks like. Right. I showed you that already. Uh, you want to look at it again? I can show you again. So. Uh, if we look at the test data, that's why I included these. Otherwise, you know, this is what this line looks like, right? So this is, you know, straight out of my scan keys and I just copy and paste it and put it in there. So that's what's going into the function. 
So that gets parsed, and then that turns that turns into a host key, which is a binary. This thing that they don't tell you is that it is a binary. So it gives you a public key. Uh, and at first you hear public key, and you think, oh, it's going to be another pen file public key, right? No, 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 no. <laughs> it's not. It's not. And so you actually have to marshal it. Um, and that's what this is about, right? So... And, and I, there's no way I would have known that without searching for it. So parse public key parses an SSH public key formatted for use in the SSH wire protocol, according to RFC 4253 section 6.6. .6. This is a binary thing. And, and if you tried, which I did, I tried to pass the host key straight into here and failed miserably because, I mean, you can guess it, right? It's, it's not the same, right? So it's not a string at all. And, and so I could not, I, I tried to put uh, the fixed host key right here. I tried to put the string, the PEM string for the host key there. Um, no, it just did not work. So, so, so then what did I do? I said, okay, fine. Um, we, I did this and then I did parse uh, public key. And that gives me, uh, that gives me binary data. I, I don't know if it's ASN.1. I don't know. I, I, I don't know if that's the RFC. Did you see the link there? Mm. But but this step, just don't forget this step if you're doing this. You you've got to you parse the authorized key file, which is text. This is text. H key here is text, and then you get some binary data. This host key that's that's good to go over the network, right? And then you have to parse that binary data into more binary data. <laughs> All right. So now now it's 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 still binary. Host pub is still binary, right? Uh, and this is actually where I got in reading about encoding slash PEM because if I, I was like, well, what if I want to take that public key that I just extracted out of the localhost file and I wanted to save it to a file? Well, you can totally do that by just looking at the file right itself. You know, you know, you know, you know. If if I wanted to do that, I could just take this thing, and delete it off, and put and put public key and put the PEM stanza, the header and the tail. I've done that before actually, and this 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 hexadecimal uh, representation would become. I I could to turn this into a PEM if I wanted to. All I'd have to do is take that and, and put it. And I don't need a PEM file for that. But if if you wanted to go through the conversion through the binary and then into PEM, you can also do that. You can do encoding uh, PEM dot encode, and then print it as a string, and it'll be a nice pretty PEM string. And, and I did it. It was kind of a waste of time. I didn't need to do that. Um, but I, I was just curious. I was curious to see, well, what is the format of all this data at every one of these stages? And this here, uh, this host pub that comes out of this, this it says Marshall, right? So it is still binary data. Uh, and then a base 64 hash of the message, yes. Um, so... So then we had, so parse public key, as it says here, is RFC 4253. I don't know if that's ASN.1 ASN or not. Ryan, you might want to look for, for me, but I don't know. Hmm. All along the way, we're returning errors if we get them. And then here's where the actual uh, connection, the remote part of everything happens. So far, it's all been setting stuff up. And then we actually make a connection. We use dial, which is, um, uh, it, you know, it takes a network string, and it takes uh, the network string is TCP IP always. I always put TCP IP uh, uh, there. The RFC, the RFC number. Uh, let me see if I can get it for you. Again, yes. Uh, RFC four two five three. Looks like. So, um, so then we have. So it's always TCP IP. You know that's again sensible default. Uh, and then what? You have your address string, which is regular. That, that comes from net uh, from the TCP, or the net a, net TCP IP um, library, I think. Um, so I mean, it comes straight from it, and it requires a port, by the way. You, a port is not optional. You have to put a colon and then a port. I think you can probably just put colon and not put the port, but I don't know. I, I went ahead and put it on no matter what anyway. And then uh, and then you have your configure. This is a a pointer to an SSH client config because there's so many things you can put in here, and then it returns the client. And then the client is ready to run sessions on and blah, 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 right? So, uh, in fact, to be fair, I should probably change the name of this. It's really not a connection. Um, it's a client. Let's do that. I'm going to change it. That's a misnomer. That is. That is not. That is a client. That is a client that got returned. So, that was good to see. So, so there's our SSH client. And uh, slightly different than a connection, but whatever. And then we pass in the username, the string that we parsed earlier. That's the thing. 
uh, we have the auth method that we put our signer on, and then we have our host keep callback. So that's all we need. There's so many things that you can put in here, right? There's the entire config, which this is as this is by the way, this is embedded from uh, the the general SSH config struct, which is for all things. I mean, this is like you can put anything you could. A lot of the stuff you could do for the servers and stuff could be put in here as well if you wanted to. Um, we don't need any of that. Now, it might be that I come across and I have to have another sensible default that I add in there, but for right now, no. So there's our user. Here's our auth methods. Um, and to get an auth method, you almost always want to run a function that's going to get you an auth method, which is a function, right? An auth method is a function. And then we have the host key callback uh, that we talked about, fixed host keys. Uh, it's not, oh, is it custom binary? Did not know. Thank you for looking that up. So, so we have the client version uh host key algorithms i mean I, I guess you could do one or two there the different host key algorithms um that's interesting i didn't explicitly set that i think that's i think that's implied because i'm using authorized keys file which has the algorithm that's used in it that's the name that nist the, the name of the nist in it i'm pretty sure that's what that is and then the timeout oops um and then we have uh, the timeout which is something i've never used before but I feel like I need to add now that I'm seeing it. Um, it means no timeout. Maximum time for DHCP connection to establish. I need to add a timeout. What should we make the timeout? Uh, should we make it like five minutes? Should we make it five minutes? It's gonna be like it's gonna be like a duration. You watch. Is it gonna? Am I gonna have to do a, a duration parse? I don't know. I, I. Yeah, I, I, it's a little bit easier than using a context, though. So. Um, mm. Time dot duration. Uh, uh, 60 or 300 with the normal defaults for most clients. I like, you're talking 300 seconds? Let's do 300. Actually, I think the timeout is already set to a default. Yeah, but let's actually set it explicitly. Timeout, um, duration. Time dot duration is a an integer. Yeah. So I have to just cast an integer if I remember right. It's been a while, but yeah. Duration. It's an in sixty four. Elapsed time between two instances. Uh, largest representation of two hundred. The duration represents elapsed time between two instances. Nanosecond count nanosecond so I think I can do this I think I can say uh, timeout let's see SSH so we can say timeout uh, times uh, time this makes it when you do this it turns it into a it turns it into a duration I'm pretty sure uh, timeout times time dot second and we'll add a timeout up here as a variable. This would be a package of global. Um, I mean, I could make that an argument to the run thing. But, I mean, because this is going to affect everything in the package, right? This is where having a functional approach versus making a client to encapsulate the other client is, you know, kind of an architectural decision. But let's go ahead and say timeout is uh, 300. Yeah, we'll just make it 300. Um, uh, timeout, say timeout, uh, default, how about that? Uh, timeout is the default a number of seconds to wait uh, to complete a TCP connection. I think it's for the um, inbound connection. I don't think it's for the entire process of the connection. I don't think it, I don't think it cuts it off. I that I might have to use a context. Yeah, that yeah, that's kind of. I'm glad we looked that up because that's uh, that's a thing. I mean, this will this will be fun to check. Okay, so anyway, so so that's handling all of our our connection. Um, I do want to look at that one more time. So it said the number a timeout of zero means no timeout. Timeout is the maximum amount of time for a TCP connection to establish. That means it's the amount of time to wait around uh, before it gets the connection. This is not 
uh, yeah, I'm actually going to change this to be TCP timeout because this is this is not you know the 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 content has been taking us a long time, right? Uh, that's a different thing, which I still need to add a context for later. Uh, we don't need that right now, but eventually we'll need that because if I, if it takes forever for the content to return, I need to definitely cancel that and, and let it, you know, time out on its own. Uh, I think SSH will probably have some time out. I think there's probably some built in timeouts with the session handler, but I don't know. And, and that's something we won't know until we've been running it for a while in production and stuff. All right, so and so and then here's where the actual work happens. So this is a connection. So this is you know we have a TCP/IP connection. After this is done, we have a TCP/IP connection running through the client, and then after this is when we can make a new you know, instance of of a command, and that's, those are called sessions. So a session equals error. We get a new one. Uh, if we have any input, we go ahead and attach it. Uh, stud in session dot stud in. Oh, let me show you. So session dot stud in is um, so let's go look at a session here. Um, so a session has all the information about the interaction with the command in it. So it, it has stud in as an IO reader. Uh, it has a stud out as an IO writer and a stud out error as an IO writer. And and the, I, that's good that it's a writer and reader because then we wouldn't necessarily have to buffer everything up, right? We could we could we could use non-buffered IO with reader and writer. I mean, less buffered, we'll say it's, it's still buffered, but, and, and then, and then we could, you know, put less memory constraint on the running application while, if it has a lot of data to process that it's going to be sending over the wire. Uh, and why would I want to do that? Well, right now I don't want to do it because it's just a simple command. This is the run command that I'm making is not for that kind of thing. But if I wanted to make my own SC SCP clone, that just catted a file as as hexadecimal or something. I mean, why would you? It would take forever to do that. But you could, right? You could do that. You could say, hey, give me this file and then, you know, put it over here. But that would be, you would never want to buffer that. It would be too much data. So that might be a, an opportunity for you to want to go do those other things. Uh, you can combine the output, which I think is stupid. Um, I think it's important to keep the output separate. Um, and you can request a subsystem. You can do all kinds of cool things. There are three commands, however, that actually execute. So start shell, which kicks off an interactive shell, run, the one we're going to use, and output. Output is the same as run. The difference is, is that it, um, it, it returns the standard output only. Combined output, same thing, just returns the standard output and error combined uh, as a big old byte slice. But we are going to do run because we want to be more granular about the stuff that we get back. We want to get standard error and out. And we want to convert it into a string too because we're going to be doing lots of stuff with strings. And again, sensible defaults for our version of this. So we're going to use the run command. Uh, and you can go read about that here. Um, let's see. SSH doc session run. Do, 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 do. Oh, oh, I know why it's doing that. Uh, because Quizzy named our package the same. That's why. Okay, here we go. So, um, yeah, the M thing. Yeah, it's nothing. It's that's all. That's all it is. I did a video on it. It's just it just makes it so I don't have to type a pipe at the end of everything all the time. Uh, so anyway, um, so we've got a uh, a funk here. We have run, runs the command. It uh, says you can do run, start, shell, output, or command output. Return error is nil if the command runs, has no problem copying anything, and exits with zero exit status. If the, if the remote server does not send an exit status or is missing, it gives a special error that you can look for, which we really don't care. I mean, that's the caller of our function is going to want that stuff, but I don't care. Uh, if the command completes unsuccessfully or is interrupted by a single error of type exit error, Otherwise, types are blah, blah, blah. Now, the, you'll see that the exit error does have a number in it. But again, as I said, you have to parse it out. It's kind of annoying. So that's next. We set up the input, the standard input, if we have any. Uh, and then I set up a new strings builder. This is by far the most performant way to do buffering of output. Uh, it's far better than bytes buffer if you've ever been using that. Bytes, pre, uh, I did some research on this, but pre, um, I think it's 1.15, 
uh, the standard way to build up a writer that was a string would be used by Builder. And you see a lot of code out there. I need to make a separate video on this that has, including my code, that has bytes buffer. Um, and you don't want to do that anymore. It's not nearly as efficient. You want to use strings builder instead. Uh, and I think there's a bytes builder as well instead of, instead, I don't remember. But the strings builder is the way to go. And it, it does not do a memory transfer. It's like way, way, way more efficient. And so that's something to take note of. And so we make these, um, these little temporary variables and then we uh this we assign them uh to stud out and to stud error which are type io writer so they're not type string right they're type io writer and then after we get everything all assigned up and everything uh so that it's behaving as it should you I mean this we had to assign an io writer to stud out or stud error otherwise it wouldn't have bothered it wouldn't have it wouldn't have done anything it would have just still thrown it away and, and we actually want to assign it something so that we capture that output. And so that output is going to be captured into these buffers, these string buffers. And then, and then we run it to get our error. We, use, uh, uh, we set the error to get the exit error. And then we run the command. And then we assign uh, the dot .string, which is a variable on the builder that will give you the accumulated string. And, and that is the, the big old you know, full string thing. And we're, we're done. And now, now we have our function that works. Um, uh, okay, <laughs> bye. And so, so, so there we go. Um, if we go to, if we go to the test now, uh, you can see what this looks like to execute it. Now, I'm using an example test because I default to example tests all the time. They're just so much easier to write. And I'm ignoring the output for now, just for the sake of this. I'm going to comment this out, obviously, because. You're gonna, you'll see that that the the results are. I, mean, I could I could never run this. This is not the kind of test that I could run from, from uh, you know the 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 playground or the go playground or something like that. This, but 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 test, testing is always the best way to test execution. And example tests, in my opinion, are the easiest to write for this kind of thing. So this is what we did. Mm. We're gonna read that entire file in. We're gonna read this file entirely in. Uh, could have pulled it from the environment or whatever. And then we're going to return standard out, standard error, uh, our actual error. We're going to run it. We're going to pass blah at localhost22, which, as you saw me doing on the command line, is an account on the system uh, that is set up to be able to, you know, to log in and everything. Uh, but I, 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 you saw that without the dash identity file, the dash I, when I did it from the command line, if you remember back to earlier in the video, I failed to make a connection because it, it didn't know about me. It, and then I gave it a dash I to point it at my private key and, and same pem file that I'm passing to this and it worked, right? So, so it is important that you understand how this stuff relates to what would normally be done with the SSH com client command on the command line, because there is a one-to-one -one relationship to that kind of stuff. So, so then we have this pulling in and we have the U key getting passed, the H key getting passed. We have our, our cat hello program right and 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 that gives you this is me testing standard output and standard input so hello is being sent as standard input a cat is the command we're sending it to and then i went ahead and put these little delimiters here so that i could see what was going on so let's go ahead and run that uh go test and see what happens uh oh it didn't like my change that i made time duration uh tcp timeout time time duration time mismatch and time duration well i i made that's what i get for making changes live Let's go fix that, shall we? So, uh, we should probably make this, um, I mean, let's do it. Let's say 300. Let's, let's actually make it an actual duration. 300 times uh, time dot second. How about that? TCP. Yeah, then we can just use the TCP timeout. That should that should be fine. Let's try that. All right, so let's run that. And okay, so it took a little while because it it made a simulated remote connection to, you know, not really a remote system, localhost, but as if it had made a remote connection to it. And you can see that my standard out is hello. Uh, because why? Because it was the standard input that was sent to the cat command on the remote machine, 
right? And there's no errors and there was no errors. Okay, so now let's let's mess with it. Let's like test it some more and see what we can do to break it. So let's uh, let's let's not give it any standard input, and let's give it ls dash l d tilde. Let's see if it resolves our tilde for us. What's that going to do, right? We're going to run that and we see, oh, hey, look, it got our thing, right? So that was standard out. Now, let's try to dump the shadow file, which I don't have permission to on the remote system, right? Hopefully. <laughs> that would suck if we did. So let me try to do that. So cat, Etsy, shadow, you know, cross your fingers up to die. This doesn't work, right? Because I don't want to give up my shadow file. To, I mean, you could, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be bad anyway. But, uh, but so now when you run it, it's actually going to see, you can see where the output went. See, the output went to standard error this time. And here's the error. Here's the error. So we have process exited with status 1. Because why? And, that, and I says, hey, that is the only place I know to get the error message. And, and let me show you why. So if I do SSH uh, exit error, this is, this is what was, was passed, right? The exit error has a wait message inside of it, but it does not have... I, I don't understand why they didn't make an integer... Uh, one of the struct fields for the exit error that I think that's kind of silly. Um, I mean, one of the main things that you always want from a command that executes is the return value is the exit value. And, and we can't get it. You can't get it without parsing. As far as I know, if somebody knows the answer to that, please let me know. Cause I, that, that's something I searched for long and hard and could not find it anywhere. So as you can see, um, you know, our test is working, uh, and, you know, we can we can play around with different sorts of things. Um, we could, you know, run it on a different port if we wanted to. Uh, what, watch what happens if I if I get rid of the key. If it can't, let's if, if there's no U key, right? So if the U key can't be parsed, let's like break that for a second. Well, what's going to happen there? So it's like, oh, nothing. And then we get an actual error, SSH, no key found, right? So that's one of the errors up higher in the stream uh, of our, or higher in our code, right? Uh, if I take a, the host key, what if what if we messed with the the host public key? Uh, what would happen? I mean, this you, you might want to do more thorough automated testing than I'm doing, but this is a good way to get a sense of what's happening, especially when you're trying to figure out whether your keys are bork and everything. So if I go through and I like mess with my key, let's do that. Let's put like a Q at the beginning of my private key. Now what? Now I should crash, right? Let's try it again. Uh oh, no key found. It could not find the key, so I got to get rid of the queue. Let's see if it works this time. Go test permission. Died. Okay, so that way it worked. Uh, what happens if we mess with the the host key, right? Uh, what happens if we get rid of this first? This is kind of interesting because the first field is optional. I found this out the hard way. Yeah, so <laughs> I can actually delete the first field localhost, and it should still work if I remember right. Uh, yeah, see, it worked. You see how it worked? So it doesn't need it. And I think I can remove this field too. Here, let's let's copy it. So copy test data host host pub key to temp. And let's let's just I wanna try to break it. I like breaking things. So let's break this. Let's I want to get rid of the algorithm now and see if it still can, can I think the reason it survives is because because of the known host file. I think it does not have to have the algorithm in it. Honestly, I don't I don't know that for sure, but I'm gonna have to test it right now. So Let's do that. So this is just the key. This is just the key. Let's see if it survives. No key found. Okay, so nope. Now I am curious though if 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 I change the 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 parse method. I was playing with this the other day. If I change the parse method from authorized keys to known hosts, I think it that that one that we have right now actually qualifies as a known host. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try this just really quick. Known hosts. Uh, there we go. Oh no! But then I have to change the whole function return signature. Look at that! Look at that mess. This is like the ugliest return values ever. I'm not doing that. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. We'll keep it authorized keys. So so we learned something there, right? So copy temp. Uh, what was it? Host key pub back into test data. And it, the the first one is the is the comment one. So, uh, so we can put okay. So there it is back again. But as I said, you can put your local host in here as a reminder. Uh, but it's it's completely optional. And go test to make sure I didn't break anything. 
but I think, you know, I think we have a, a, a working program. It's, it's going out, it's doing what it's been asked to do. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm not going to leave it catting Etsy shadow, but, but, but we can make it do pretty much anything. And, 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 and this includes sudo. So, um, if, if, if you, we, one of the things we are doing is we're, we're making an agent command that has sudo access to do very specific things. Uh, and that is not in the scope of this, what I'm writing, but if you could do that, you could do sudo whatever, and then run, run a program as long as the user blah, in this case, has sudo access to run the command that you're running, you can actually run as another user under sudo and this stuff will still get all get translated back to you properly. Um, so, so there's some kind of interesting possibilities you can do there. Uh, ls dash, we'll just say cat and then put hello here and back to where I was. And that's, that's really it. Um, uh, would it need a no pass and suitors? No. Uh, well, yeah, that, but it would be for that specific command. Yeah. And that's, that's what we're going to do. Actually, we're, we have one specific command that is extremely locked down and it will run with root permissions and it, it does have to do things as the effective user. Uh, and it, it's not going to be running set UID, but, but it will definitely have that. So, that is a separate piece of our particular thing because we have other, you know, non-service based API considerations to think about, which are like command line API stuff. So all our stuff is like, you know, authorized through user authentication on the machine. And so in order to run something on that machine as that user, they've already authenticated through OAuth even to get to the, uh, through our Apogee gateway, even to get to, our middleware so we can trust the username by the time that they're, they're there we have a token and everything and if we wanted to bolster our security eventually i mean it's a lot of real rights of code we could pass the oauth token uh down and we could have you know our agent uh on the on on, on our our jump host we could have the agent actually check the token for authenticity before it ran and then we would have more of a zero trust sort of thing going on um you don't know where I work, so that's fine. Please don't say where I work if you know. Um, but that, but that, that they haven't been running that way for over two decades. So, you know, they're they're. I mean, for God's sake, they've had our login in our shell for a long time too. So, so, so this is this is a step in the right direction because it's going to be less error prone and and it's going to allow them to have you know web front ends and all all, all, all essentially what well, I mean. Th th let's talk about that for a second before we leave this. Why why on earth would you do this, right? Well, one of the reasons for doing this is because there are a lot of legacy systems that are designed to run as CGI scripts and, you know, ancient, and we have 18,000 lines of Perl. I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of, of crufty code out there that's been designed to run through environmental interaction, setting environment variables and running. And, and to get to that technical debt stuff so that you can, you can, you know, you can kind of architect your way out of your technical data a little bit, you need to create uh, front end service interfaces to this stuff so that the, the applications become dependent on a standardized front end, a very, very, very highly standardized front end uh, API. In our case, we use Apogee and REST for that. Uh, and, and that allows you, gives you the freedom to upgrade your, your, where your, 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 your points of, of technical debt and then, and, you know, put modernized things. And in this case, we're going to be getting rid of a lot of links. In fact, um, it's not, I, I'm pausing because I want to make sure I'm not violating any kind of terms of service with my, my company here. But in this particular case, what we thought was going to be we were going to call, so our middleware was going to call other middleware that was running a CGI. And then that middleware, you know, calls PBC uh, with its own encapsulation layer. And then that finally calls PBC. So it's like four hops away from the actual execution. Um, and we found that there was a bunch of crufty old stuff that had been added into the Perl CGI stuff that prevented the direct run of that, of the, of the stuff behind that, that could could be run from our jump hosts from the command line by our users and so what we ended up doing is bypassing all of that stuff 
in kind of in an emergency situation, not an emergency, but we've been, you know, wanting to get this done. And so in order to do an end run around all of that legacy old code, when there was already another way to get to that functionality through the command line and our jump hosts or batch processors, they we could go we can now execute the same exact commands verbatim that our end users are using by adding something as simple as this 80 line, um, you know, this 80 line, you know, SSH client into our middleware combined with a very, very controlled uh, sudo enabled agent account uh, on our jump host that can emulate any one of our users on the system. Um, and, and by doing that, we completely went around all of the crufty old Perl um, middleware. We're not using any of it anymore. And, and there's, there's, there's a bunch of, I mean, there's, that's not completely true. There's, I mean, a lot of the, 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 you know, QStat stuff that is emulated. There's another layer on top of that, that, that it, it's, it's, it, it's, it's the stuff right before you get to PBC. And so at some point we may even, we even get rid of that and go straight to PBC. And then, and then that will be only like three hops from the, from the code. Um, and, you know, I mean, short of writing another microservice on the endpoint, but so, so why would you care about running SSH? Because so many things, I mean, Ansible, if anything, Ansible has been a testament to the prevalence of SSH. SSH has been used for several decades as the glue between all of these disparate systems um, so that you can do things on different systems and kind of like, you know, weasel your way through, whether you're a hacker or you're an operations person, you're writing middleware or platform engineer, you're, you're, you need to get to these things and knowing how to do that with SSH. And it all starts with being able to set up a nice, easy, happy client connection, authenticated, secure client connection. And that's what we've done today. So it's a long, a little bit longer video than I would have liked to have made. And we're about an hour into it, but, but um, hopefully this gives you, gives you something to work with. Um, let me know. I mean, in order to make this uh, enterprise robust, this is just a client connection. You probably want to encapsulate this inside of um, some sort of Go routine with concurrency. You probably also want to have a, a number of target hosts. So if the first host doesn't respond within a certain amount of time, you have two or three other jump hosts that you can go try as well for redundancy. Uh, you know, th those are all things that you would you would architect on top of something like this, but having the ability to make a single SSH connection to a specific target as a specific user is the grander piece of this that, that you have to have in order to make all the plumbing work. So hopefully that gives you something to think about and play around with.